And so we continue in worship with scripture. But first we pray. Will you pray with me? Father, scripture says that you gave your only son so that whoever might believe in him wouldn't perish but, but have life and that, that Jesus came not to condemn the world but, but to save it. God, we need, we need some Jesus right now. This world needs some Jesus right now. We could do with some saving. And so we thank you, Father, in advance for the work that you are going to do in us today. We pray that you soften our hearts for the reading of your word, that you open our spiritual eyes and ears to what you have for us, God, because we know that you have something. So come on. Speak, Father, because your children were listening. Amen. Okay, so how cool was it to have Ben back for two whole weeks? Yeah? He's going to watch this later, so kind of play it up a little bit. Come, really? That's it? All right. I love you, Ben. He, he did an amazing job. And actually, I didn't bring my preaching Bible with me today. I brought the Bible that I use for my personal devotion with me this morning because that's where I wrote my notes from his sermon. I was on vacation, so I didn't get to come and hear him in person, but I, I watched him online. We're going to go back, actually, to his scripture, and we're going to pick up from there. So this is Mark chapter 6, verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done. Do you remember that? Do you remember when, when he was preaching last week about that chaos? Do you remember that? He said this. He said, this is Ben. He said, Jesus knew the disciples were too busy. He knew that they were too busy. He knew his people. And so he did this, it says in the next verse. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. They were so busy, they were hungry. They weren't even stopping for food. They had so much to do. Jesus had equipped them with so much power that they were just going and going and going. And so they went away in a boat to a desolate place, because Jesus said so, by themselves. Now, many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he, Jesus, had compassion on them, because that's who Jesus is, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things, and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages by themselves to buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said five and two fish. And then he commanded them all to sit down in groups by the hundreds in the green grass. So they sat down by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of fish. And those who are the loaves were five, who ate the loaves, excuse me, were 5,000 men. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up to the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. 
and he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Genesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch the fringe of his garment, and as many as touched it were made well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God indeed. That's a lot of words, y'all. Jesus had equipped them to do amazing things. Amazing things. And they did them. They went and they did them. And they came back and they were like, Jesus, did you see that? This is so cool. And Jesus says, yes, 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 that's great. However, you've got to recognize that I, I see a bigger picture. And so he told them to get in a boat. Do you remember that from last week? I have to tell you, when we are preparing a sermon series such as this, we have been in the Gospel of Mark for a very long time. If you have not noticed, this is the series that we are in. We are currently in chapter 6. I have verses 45 through 56 and all the other verses that I just read to you. And the title of my sermon is supposed to be Jesus Climbs Into Your Boat. And I think that's great. And it is, in fact, the title of my sermon. But what you need to know is that I am human. Did you know that? I am. Do any of you hear a phrase and, like, break into song in your brain? Yes. Thank you, Alicia. Anyone else? Nobody does that? You hear it? Liani. That's my girl. Okay. So I read this for the very first time, and I, I did... I did confess this to our pro team earlier this week, but I read this, Jesus climbs into your boat, and the first thing that popped into my mind was one of the best songs ever by one of the greatest theologians of our time, Dolly Parton. And she has a song called Nine to Five. And in it, it says, thank you. In it, it says, in the same boat with a lot of your friends, waiting for the day your ship will come in. You know, in their Dolly Parton way. So the disciples were in the same boat with a lot of their friends, waiting for the day when their ship will come in, maybe, I don't know. But they were definitely in the boat. But here's the thing, they got in because Jesus told them that they needed to be able to focus on him, to learn um, who he was more, to just rest for a little bit because of all of that chaos that goes on when you're busy, busy, busy all of the time. And what happened? All of the people saw that they were in the boat. All of the people saw where they were going, and somehow, maybe there was a bridge or something, I don't know, but they beat them. They beat them there. They beat them to the destination. And so the disciples get there, and Jesus gets there, and there are somehow all of these other people, and they're already there. They're waiting. They're ready for the more to do. So the disciples who'd gotten into a boat to just, you know, hang out with Jesus for a little while, to just rest, grab some renewal, Maybe take a, take a lunch break. There was work to do when they landed. And Jesus, when he saw them, he had compassion on them because that's who Jesus is. They were like sheep without a shepherd. They had no idea what to do or where to go or how to be, but they knew that Jesus did. 
There was something about him that got their attention, and that caused him to have such great compassion on them that he sat and he stayed with them. He got to know them, and more importantly, he let them get to know him. And the disciples around dinner time, because you know they hadn't eaten in the story before, so I bet they're still pretty hungry, were like, hey, it's time for dinner. And so we need to send these people away so everyone can eat. And what does Jesus do? What's he say? He says, you feed them. And I can imagine the disciples sitting there, and they're like, huh? Because scripture says that it's 5,000 men. So what is that? If there are women and children there as well, it's like 15,000 people. Do you know that I don't want to have a dinner party with 15 people, much less 15,000 people? How's that for some hospitality? Right? And the disciples are like, what, 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 no, how? how? What is happening right now? I don't even understand this. Jesus, come on. And Jesus says, okay, have any of you done parenting with love and logic? Anybody at all? And thank you. Okay. And, and it's one of these things, one of the things that you try with your kids is, well, here's something that other kids have tried. So Jesus parents them with love and logic and says, okay, well, why don't we maybe start with what do we have? What do we have here with us? And so they said, oh, Jesus, that's an excellent idea. So they went to go find out. Turns out they didn't have very much. And so they weren't really encouraged by the loaves and the fishes that they collected. And Jesus said, seriously, he didn't say that, but I'm imagining that that's what he thought. And he had them all sit down on the green grass. And what did he do? I just read it. What did he do? He fed them all. How many baskets were left over? I got all day. How many baskets were left over? Thank you. There were 12 baskets left over. That's amazing, right? Okay, so he fed all of these thousands of people, and it was a miraculous event that the disciples saw, and they experienced, and they were a part of, and then scripture says that they immediately got into a boat, because that's what they're doing in this section of Mark. There's just lots of boats involved, and so they get into a boat, and and they start to go, but Jesus, Jesus is not in their boat. Jesus stays back. And our scripture says that he dismisses the people. And so this is what I imagine that looks like. Because at the end of worship, we give a blessing or a benediction, and then all of you go that away, right? And we may be able to see one or two of you, but Jesus, Jesus is God, and Jesus can do things a little bit differently. And so I'm imagining Jesus did something like this. Okay, Josh, <laughs> now that you know me, this is how the future's going to go, all right? And I'm imagining that he did, he did that kind of thing with, with all of them because when Jesus, when Jesus came to someone and when Jesus saved someone, he did not leave them the way that he found them. And so I'm just imagining that Jesus did that, not just with Josh, but with all of you, with them. All right, so anyway... Jesus is doing that, right? Well, then he goes to pray because Jesus knows where Jesus needs to be rooted, right? Jesus doesn't need to be told that Jesus needs to take a break. But then it comes time to go meet his disciples. They're still in the boat, right? Well, Scripture says that it's not going so well, that there are winds, and they're crashing in, and it's just it's chaos everywhere. They're in this boat. They're by themselves, and Jesus is like, all right, I guess I'll go over there. And so it says that he just starts to do this. I'm walking on carpet, but what was he walking on? He was walking on water. Thank you, all of the kids. He was walking on water. Do you know that I was so tempted, you guys, to like buy a a, a case of water and just preach this entire sermon standing on it because that's the closest I'm ever going to get? But I didn't do that. But now you have it in, in your mind that I could have done that, right? So anyway, he's walking on the water, and the disciples see him, and what do they do? They freak out. They're scared. They're terrified, actually, to the point where Jesus has to say, why are you afraid? It's me. Fear not. It is I. It's me, Jesus. And then what does he do? Jesus climbs into the boat. 
Thank you. I don't know who said it back there, but good job. Jesus climbs into the boat, and what happens? Thank you. All right, this group right here, you win. It starts to cease. It starts to ease. It becomes manageable because Jesus climbed into the boat. Now, what happens after that is they, they keep going, and they keep going, and they te- keep teaching, and they keep preaching, and they keep healing, and then they go somewhere else, and they teach, and they preach, and they heal, and they go somewhere else, and they teach, and they preach, and they heal, and they go somewhere else, and what do they do? Very good. They do all of that. They teach, and they preach, and they heal. There's lots to be done. So what makes this story so important? See, these are the disciples. These are the ones who were walking with him and talking with him and preaching and teaching and healing with them. And even they, when the storm came upon them, were terrified. They were even terrified when they saw Jesus because they were only looking at what their human eyes would let them see. They were only looking at what their experience had taught them to believe. And they'd just seen the biggest dinner party in history. They just witnessed it. Right? It says in this passage that they didn't understand because their hearts were hard. Brothers and sisters, we hear week after week, excellent, did you hear that, Wade? Excellent sermons on what it looks like to take our faith and share it, to be the hands, the feet, the body, the mouthpiece of Christ in this world, to not just keep what's transformed us to ourselves, but but to go out and be Christ-like. But can I tell you something? And it's for me as well. I can't be like someone I don't know. And we can read these stories over and over and over and over again, and we might know every fill-in-the-blank answer to everything in the stories that I just told. But if we don't know the Jesus that these stories are about, we have nothing to share that's any different than something that someone would have learned in literature class. It's a new year. And I know that in my life, there are a few boats that I need to invite Jesus into. Not because Jesus doesn't want to be in those boats, but because I haven't invited him into them. When was the last time you invited Jesus into the boat of your marriage? When was the last time you invited Jesus into the boat of your finances? When was the last time you invited Jesus into the boat of your health? Your parenting. the church, and how you engage. Today, I'm going to pray for myself and for every one of us, and I'm I'm really hopeful that you'll pray with me. To not be afraid to let Jesus in, because we know he's going to shake some things up, but he's also going to calm some storms, y'all that we can try and try and try to calm ourselves, but it's not ever going to be successful. He is the only one that can do that. And we will never be the disciples that he's created us to be until we know him more. We fall in love with him more. And we walk just a little bit closer to him every day. 
Last week, Pastor Ben gave the covenant prayer to all of you, and so we have more copies of that on the prayer rail. When you come up for communion, you are welcome to take one, 10, or 15, 15,000 if you want. We can make copies. Take as many as you want. They'll help with the surrender. And we're going to pray now to help with the relationship. Let's pray. Jesus, Jesus, you do mighty and miraculous things in Scripture. And we know that it is not only in Scripture that you do these mighty and miraculous things because you are doing them all around us all the time. We pray right now that our eyes and ears might be open to where you are and what you're doing, that we might see your hand in this world, your hand on our own lives, your hand on this church. Jesus, you are at work. Help us to be thankful. Help us to be aware. I pray that you soften our hearts to you. I pray that you put within us the deepest desire to jump into your word anew. Begin a fire within us for you to know you more, to love you more to follow you more closely. Not to know about you, but to know you and to be changed from the inside out. We confess that there are areas in our lives where we have allowed darkness to exist for far long enough. Jesus, light of the world, Shine on us. Shine in those places. There are boats that we have not invited you into. We invite you now into the boat of our hearts. We are so tempted so often to believe that what we see and what we experience is all that there is. But Jesus, you know that there is more. Help us to see your more. Help us to have faith in your more. And help that faith shape how we share you more. Help us to not be content in our hearts to know stories about you, but to learn who you are. Help us to let go of discouragements and bitterness that we have held on, to, held on to for far too long. Jesus, light up those dark places. You are the light of the world. You are the only one who can break down the barriers that we have constructed. Make it so. Jesus, we invite you into the boat of our families. You are the head. We are not we think that we know the way to go, Jesus, but the truth is, if we haven't asked you first, we know nothing. So give us your wisdom, give us your discernment, give us a heart for you so that we might love our families better. We might lead more closely to where you are following every area of our home, Jesus. Be present in new and exciting ways. Do what only you can do in our families. For our children, help us to rear them well. And help us to look upon our spouse, now or future, as the gift that they are. Help us to love them as you love us. Not a contractual kind of love, Jesus, that says, what have you done for me lately, but a covenant sort of love that asks, what have I done for you? Guide us, Jesus. We surrender our families to you. Our bodies, Jesus, climb into the boat of our health. 
We know what it is that we are to do. We know how to maintain the temple that you have given us, and yet we don't do the things we know that we should. And sometimes we refuse to seek consultation for fear of what someone might find. But Jesus, we pray that you give us courage to take care of the body you've gifted us with. We pray for healing for those who are broken. Jesus, get into the boat of our health. And not just our health, Lord, but our finances. You are King of King and Lord of Lords over it all. It isn't ours, it's yours in the first place. So guide us well into how to manage, how to use our finances. Get into it deep, Jesus. Because we have pride as humans that will not allow us to ask for help, ask for guidance. We think we can do it. Well, we're not three, Jesus. I do it is not good enough. So break into our hearts, break into our families, break into our health, break into our finances, break into our job, Lord, our vocation, our volunteer opportunities. Jesus, get into that boat. Help us to know you more in every aspect of our lives. There is nowhere that we can live where we're going it alone. We need you, Jesus. So Holy Spirit, come. Tear down the walls. Break through the barriers. Soften our hearts. Open our eyes and our ears. Do what only you can do. We surrender to you. We believe that you have something for us. 